Welcome to the New Heights Show on Education. I'm Pamela Clark, founder and director of the New Heights Educational Group, and I'm here with David Smith, the founder of Silicon Valley High School, who has helped us get these podcasts produced and delivered to you. Yes, Pamela, when we saw the great things that you and your army of volunteers are achieving in New Heights, we wanted to get involved. We're happy to work with you to leverage the internet, make quality education accessible and affordable to everyone and everybody. Thank you, David. We appreciate Silicon Valley High School helping us to get these podcasts out to the hundreds of thousands of listeners from all over the world. So we hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the New Heights Show on Education. This is Pamela Clark, Executive Director of the New Heights Educational Group and owner of the show. Um, we are doing a episode on news and education, and I hope this uh, show shares some stories with you that you haven't heard, and we ask that you share it with others, and follow us, and leave feedback. We always love to hear from the audience. So let's get right on into it. Uh, the first story I have to report on is from ASCD Smart Brief. It was sent to our inbox on December the 8th. Survey, uh, this is under teaching and learning. A pandemic takes tool on ELL students, English language learners. More than 56% of educators who support English language learners worldwide say the coronavirus pandemic had a significant effect on students' learning. According to a survey by Off to Class, a company that provides resources to English as a second language educators and serves more than 90,000 students in 120 countries, of those surveyed, 38.7% said their ELL students should have repeated the grade. You can find the entire story if you're interested in it on the74million.org. And it's under news and then it has pandemic. And it says survey dash 56% of educators working with English learners say pandemic significantly disrupted learning nearly four and 10 say students should have repeated a, a grade. So um, in other words, nearly 40% of 669 educators who serve English language learners around the world said they should have repeated last school year because of pandemic related learning loss and according to a recent survey. So what do you think of that? Do you agree with that? I kind of le lean towards agreeing because I just don't see how they received an education with everything that happened. Now, the um, 90,000 students served that I had mentioned are from 120 countries, supposedly. There is a graph here on this page. If you want to see it, just follow the link that I told you and type in the story. And you'll be able to see that um, there's actually two graphs on the page, just FYI. <clears throat> Another story from the same smart brief shared that um, schools, this is under transform, transformational leadership, excuse me, schools screen applicants for cultural competency. School districts increasingly are asking candidates for teaching positions questions about cultural competency, equity, and race. Lauren Deschel, founder and CEO of Nimble, says while districts have asked such questions for about five to ten years, recent events have allowed the practice to become more common and questions have become more direct. If you want to read the entire article, uh, you can find that on Education Week, and it's dated 12-7. So what do you think of that? 
What do you think of um, them asking these types of questions? And why do you think they're asking these types of questions? Also, in the same smart brief, uh, the National Constitution Center reports that free, no prep online lessons are available now. It says that it brings the constitutional conversations into your classroom with scholar exchanges, part lecture, part lively conversation. They're weekly from 30 to 45 minute classes and they're accessible on Zoom and YouTube. Uh, it says they're easily incorporated into your schedule and supported with reading to use uh, resources. You can learn more about this program, and I'm not advocating for it. I know nothing really about it other than it's being offered. But I will say that Hillsdale College offers free online classes through our site, including some fantastic courses on the Constitution. And um, they've just done a fantastic job of building up all these courses. So anyways, if you want to check this one out, you go to the constitutioncenter.org and go to their upcoming live classes to view what they're offering. And then you can look at it and see if it's something you want to offer in your homeschooling to your students or even consider Hillsdale College. And um, hopefully it will help you. From the same report under technology in the classroom, um, it has that nonprofits offer low cost online courses. Well, our nonprofit does that too, over 1,280 of them, free and discounted. This is from TL Education, an online education nonprofit, has partnered with 32 regionally accredited partner universities and 161 high schools in 15 states to offer low cost online college courses for students. However, some faculty at the universities have raised concerns about the standard standard sorry standardization of content developed by third parties. You can read the full story about this um, on Insider Higher Ed, which is InsideHigherEd.com, and then it's um, under News. And online course provider shop more affordable college credit. It was written by Suzanne with a Z and two N's and a Smalley, um, so two L's. And it was published December 7th. I probably don't need to share this one with you, but um, I will. It is titled, why, why Some Families Are Choosing Online Learning. If even as schools return to in-person instruction, some families are opting to enroll their children in full-time virtual programs. In this blog post, parents share the challenges and benefits of their decisions, including Megan Hernandez, who writes that it allows her family to play a more active role in her son's education. You can read the, the whole story at Smart Brief Splash Education. And also, uh, SCOTUS to consider school policy, school choice policy in Maine. The US Supreme Court is scheduled to hear arguments today, this was dated December 6th, on whether a policy in Maine should allow or not to allow the use of public funds for tuition at schools that provide religious education and that violates families' constitutional rights. Lower courts have ruled in favor of the state saying the policy holds the separation of church and state. This was reported by Time on December 6th if you want to look that story up as well. Bear with me when I switch to the next story. There's always a lot of them to cover, and I, I always have more than I need. 
So um, it makes it a little challenging, but I think they're important to share with you so you know what's happening. So this next one is also from Smart Brief on EdTech. This was the state sent to our inbox on December the 8th. Top news. Um, this is under top news for them. And this is under Instagram unveils, unveils new measures to protect teens. The Instagram CEO, Adam Maziri, is scheduled to testify today, and this is December 8th, before the U.S. Senate, where he's expected to address efforts to enhance protection for teenagers, teenage users of the social media platform. On Tuesday, the company announced several enhanced safety features, including parental control and an ability to prevent tagging or mentioning teens in the Instagram posts. The story was picked up by CNBC on December 7th and CBS on December 8th. A lot of articles from this mailing are repeats from the previous. Okay, the, the next one that I have is from ASCD. It's from K-12 Leadership Smart Brief. It was mailed to us on December the 8th. Um, let's see here. There's a lot of them, but again, some are repeats. Okay, this is under technology combines extracurriculars and academic tutoring. And it says that students at Lincoln Elementary School in Iowa can participate in dance lessons before receiving academic tutoring, while other students can work on their jump shots. Principal Megan Elsinger says that the school added extracurricular activities to its after school tutoring program. Student interest has risen significantly and the school plans to add more activities later in the year. You can read about the this full story at Telegraph Herald in um, Iowa. It was dated, it was Topeka, Iowa, uh, dated December the 3rd. Now I will say that personally, I don't think that that would necessarily help them with their academic learning. I mean, movement is important for students, but specific movement can help with studies in different ways. So I would challenge you to look at kinesthetic learning and learn about brain gym if you've never heard of it. Those are the types of things that if they're gonna be doing physical education, and in my opinion, those are the types of things they should be doing instead of just random things. I don't think they're going to see a big uh, change in individual students uh, doing it that way. That's my personal opinion. This is under uh, policy and research in that same email and it says, how districts are getting absent students back to class. And it says residency compliance and student support specialists, as well as traveling family resource bus are helping to locate a Virginia district absent student. The superintendent, Maria Petri Martin says, other districts are using a connection building model to build relationships with students and keep them engaged in coming to school. This full story, can be found at districtadministration.com. And when you get on um, that site, you will see, you can do a search and you can do three views on the best ways to track down missing students dash, uh, I'm sorry, students post dash COVID. So, um, you can read all about that there.
This next report comes in from Homeschool Legal Defense Administration. It came in on December the 8th. The first story I have for you is a is titled Parents Stand Up to School Board Out of Conviction. This was written by Dave Dentel, who is a web content manager, and it was dated December 8th. It says that Jennifer Moy was has homeschooled her kids in three states each with its own education laws. Her husband, Matt, is an officer in the United States Air Force, so they understand the need to respect authority and abide by regulation. So why are they challenging a mandate by their local public school district, a demand that Jennifer admits that in some respects is so trivial, that's a quote, because they believe it's the right thing to do. Giving in to something she sees as unlawful, said Jennifer, could ultimately nullify the reasons they homeschool and undermine the specific choices that make the educational option work so well for the family. Quote, somebody has to stand up and say enough, she said. Stop pushing people around. A question of law. The Moines asked Homeschool Legal Defense Association to represent them in an appeal to the Rome, New York School Board after the individualized home instruction plan, IHIP. They submitted for their oldest son, a sixth grader, was rejected. The only reason officials refused to accept the plan was because it did not list resources for teaching about age. You heard that right. Homeschool Legal Defense contends that the regulation requiring aid and education applies only to public and private school students, not homeschoolers. Also, excuse me, Jennifer said she wants to teach this topic at a time and in a way that is best for her children. If the appeal process fails and the IHIP is still rejected, after all legal remedies are exhausted, the family risks being accused of not complying with compulsory education laws. As Jennifer explained in an interview, it would have been easy to amend the plan, but there were broader issues at stake. For one thing, the mandate to teach AIDS comes on top of regulations that are already burdensome. To legally homeschool in New York, families must submit an annual notice of intent, an IHIP for each child being homeschooled, and quarterly reports that document each student's progress throughout the school year and year-end student assessment. That's a lot. We don't need to do that much in Ohio, that's for sure. This flood of documentation is reviewed and filed by officials at the local school superintendent's office which means that a single public employee interpretation of the law can add to the red tape. Adding to the burden, which is what seems to have happened in Rome, New York, families who homeschool in the district, including some who have been doing it there for more than a decade, say a, re a recent spate of rejected IHIPs traces back to when a new official took over the processing their paperwork. Jennifer is quick to point out that the official has always been kind and professional. She added, I think she, this is a quote, I think she believes she is just doing her job. Regardless of intent, Homeschool Legal Defense Staff Attorney T.J. Smith said that the way Rome School District is treating homeschool families amounts to overreach. Officials are assuming their job is to subjectively review the home instruction program rather than simply determine whether parents have submitted the information required in the IHIP, he said. In Rome, IHIPs are being rejected because the district wants families to provide them 
provide more than a list of textbooks claiming lack of familiar, familiarity with the content of the curriculum. Jennifer can attest to this. Her family started homeschooling in New York in the fall of 2019. She submitted the required paperwork and didn't encounter any problems. Then after handling or handing in her third quarter report for 2020-2021 school year, Jennifer heard from the district homeschool official who requested photos of the table of contents for all textbooks the family was using. This year, Jennifer proactively submitted the additional information in each of the three children's homeschool plans to avoid further trouble. Each IHIP was 12 pages long. Then came the demand regarding AIDS instruction. At that point, she and her husband decided to fight. Quote, if they can ask for something that's not legally required of me, Jennifer said, then what's going to be next? Jennifer went on to say that she and her husband thought seriously before deciding to challenge the AIDS education mandate. Likewise, their initial decision to homeschool was not an easy one. When the older son reached kindergarten, their inclination was to enroll him in a private school. But the more she considered it, said Jennifer, the more she felt the best thing would be to teach her son at home. There were many reasons for this. Jennifer said she knew her husband's military career meant that they would move often, and homeschooling seemed like a good way to promote emotional and educational stability despite their family's, um, you know, thoughts about it. So Jennifer and Matt agreed to try homeschooling for a year, but changed their perspective after seeing their firstborn's academic progress. Quote, he loves it, said Jennifer. And he did so well. I always said he sort of spoiled us. Two more children came along in two years. But the boys stuck with what was working. Quote, once we got into the groove, there was just no turning back, Jennifer said, of their homeschooling program. Quote, it's been a beautiful, been beautiful to let them learn and grow at their own pace. Another important consideration choosing homeschool schooling was the boys wanted to ensure their children learn from a perspective steeped in their deeply held religious beliefs. Witnessing all her children made confessions of faith as Christians, said Jennifer, served to confirm that she made the right choice. Not that they keep their kids isolated. The Moy children are active in classical conversations, participate in church, and play soccer. Quote, my kids experience life, said Jennifer. They're not in a bubble. In fact, Jennifer added, she tries to use her kids' experience as a tool for teaching them in a timely and natural way, which brings her to another reason for opposing the mandate to ensure her son, to instruct her son, excuse me, about AIDS, an important and sensitive subject at a time and in a way that might not be best for him. Quote, we can have that conversation when it's appropriate, she said. Quote, we're standing up for what we believe and what we're convicted to, convicted of. So, yeah. Wow, right? What an article. Uh, also, from the Homeschool Legal Defense, Melling, uh, wash, rinse, repeat. Homeschool Legal Defense helps grad overcome cosmetology school discrimination. This school was apparently unaware of a 2013 policy that recognized, recognizes homeschool diplomas, but they resolved the situation quickly after a homeschool graduate they rejected called homeschool legal defense. So this is a graduate from Oregon and um, it was a Washington cosmetology school that refused her. I'm trying to see, let's see. Um, she had asked why the school representative explained they could not accept homeschool diplomas due to their 
school's accreditation with the National Accrediting Commission of Career Arts and Sciences. Talk about passing a buck, right? On to the next person. So uh, this all happened in Oregon, and you can look for this on the Homeschool Legal Defense website, so read more about it. Uh, some other articles you might be interested on their site as well is Off the Grid Family Shares Flexible Off-Road Travel, Remote Work, and Homeschool Experience. You may want to look that up on the Homeschool Legal Defense website. And Homeschool 12-year-olds who hold second yearly bake sale to benefit local food pantry. And then um, there's also the story on enrollment declines in DC public schools as more off for charter schools and homeschooling. Let's take a look at that one for a moment. It says that public schools declined by 855 students this year, while charter schools and homeschooling saw increases in enrollment. The decline follows what has happened nationwide as families opt for other educational options during the pandemic. According to preliminary enrollment numbers released by the state superintendent of education, just over 49,035 students attend DC public schools. This is down from 49,890 students last year and a recent high of 51,037 students in the 2019-2020 school year. Since that high, enrollment has steadily decreased by about 2% each year. There is a graph and a lot more information about this. Um, so you may wanna check that out if you wanna see all the years, all the way back to 2007 and 2008. So it goes pretty far back on, on numbers. And um, I think you find it pretty interesting if you want to look into it. Let's see here. Okay, switch to another one. Actually, um, we're going to need to take a quick commercial break. And we will be right back. Welcome back to the New High School of Education. This is Pamela Clark. We cover the news and education. Get right back into it. Uh, the next piece of news I have for you is from ASCD Smart Brief, and it was set to us on December 9th. This is under teaching and learning, and it says schools seek to curb chronic absenteeism. School districts nationwide report an uptick and chronic absenteeism, which reached 25% among ninth and 10th grade students in California. According to data examined by School Innovations and Achievement, to ensure students are on track, administrators in some districts are working to strengthen connections for students, including at Murray or Murray County High School in Georgia. It, or where every incoming ninth grader is connected with a counselor and a social worker. The full story can be found on the 74 and was dated 12 6. Under transformational leadership, EdTech leaders gained prominence during the pandemic. The rise of education technology during the coronavirus pandemic has elevated the influence of K-12 EdTech leaders 
and their teams in school leadership, asserts Lakeisha Brinson, Metro Nashville's Director of Instructional Technology and Library Services. In this article, Brinson and two other EdTech leaders describe how their roles have changed because of the rise of digital learning. The full story about this can be found at districtadministration.com. And you can just type that in it. It would say three ed-tech leaders share how COVID has made them key members of the team. It's written by Matt Zola Z or Zola Zemick, um, Z A L A Z and then Nick, N I C K. And that was published December 8th. If you want to look it up and learn more about that one. I can't share all these links. I try, but there's only so much space when we publish these. So we just can't. Um, Share them all. That's why I reference them verbally with you. Um, another report from Iowa says that students find good listeners among therapy dogs. Five dogs, three added this year, are helping students in Cedar Rapids Community School District in Iowa learn as they help soothe anxiety and stress in classrooms. While the animals are not a replacement for school counselors or social workers, teacher and the Gia Como says, the canines, including her Labradoodle and Keely, do bring smiles while serving as non-judgmental listeners for emerging readers. The full story is picked up by the Gazette in Cedar Rapids, Marion, Iowa. If you'd like to read about it. And then a story from Ball, a Boston program helps kids deal with COVID-19 loss. About 170,000 American children lost a parent or caregiver or grandparent to COVID-19 as of October, contributing to a significant increase in service requests at the Good Grief program at the Boston Medical Center. The Pediatric Mental Health Initiative identifies kids and families in need through their primary care clinician, clinic, I'm sorry, clinician, I know I'm saying that wrong, I apologize, and also help connect people with practical research or re practical resources such as food and shelter. Full story can be seen at WBUR FM in Boston and the say is 12 6. Also, news from uh, the ASPD the, the future of learning lies in engagement. As the pandemic lessens and schools begin to reopen, many voices urge schools to go down three faulty, sorry, faulty, I'm having issues today, three faulty paths to, recover, to recovery and improvement. Education research professional Andy Hargreaves suggests alternative paths that will lead to true student engagement. Read more at the educational leadership. Um, this is under faculty lounge. Um, this is national contest as students to adopt careers. The nonprofit organization American Student Assistance is launching a contest for middle school students that encourages them to explore careers. The ASA Solve Together. Tomorrow's leaders tackling today's challenges, competition ask students to adopt a career and propose solutions around topics such as climate change and public health issues. The full story can be found at uh, thejournal.com and it's under STEM and career prep 
It said, and the title is Middle School Challenge Encourages Career Exploration. And it was written by Dion Schaufhauser on December the 7th, published December 7th. The next report I have is from Ohio Ed Updates, dated December 8th. And it has um, state and local education news. Pay It Forward program rewards students for representing positive career traits. The WCHS reports that improving relationships between students and school resource officers is the intent of the Pay It Forward program in Galilee County, Ohio. Each month during the school year, a character trait is chosen and the student who best represents that trait gets a gift card. Also reporting, can buy for open Toledo school board seat. The Toledo Blade reports that Toledo Public Schools received 10 applicants for a recently vacated school board seat consisting of former GPS board member candidates for Toledo City Council and Ohio House of Representatives, as well as educators, a nurse, a social worker, and a Lucas County employee manager and financial consultant. Bristol hires Newton Falls School Treasurer. A Warren Tribune Chronicle reports that Newton Falls School Treasurer Carla Click will be heading to Bristol schools in 2022 after being hired by its Board of Education Wednesday. Click will replace Mario Nero, who is leaving Bristol at the end of the month to become treasurer for the school range schools. The South Range School, excuse me. Also reporting, um, reports look at technical education career. Crane's Cleveland Business Reports, beautiful article titled, Ohio offers $150 million in grants to improve access to child school, child care. And it says a new analysis is found Career technical education and training in Ohio generated $1.4 billion in direct and indirect economic activity, including purchases related to construction, renovation equipment in 2019. Okay, next stories that I have from you are from the Smart Brief on EdTech, which was sent to us on December the 9th. Uh, top news. EdTech leaders gained prominence during the pandemic. Okay, I think we already covered that one. Again, they do a lot of repeating. Um, Here's one on the system management. They have cyber thieves targeting colleges. Cybersecurity firm Proofpoint is warning colleges and universities of a dramatic rise in COVID-19 related cyber attacks. The fish the rising attack against campuses began in October and tried to mimic college login portals and harvest credentials. For college accounts. You can read all about this at uh, Campus Technology and, and dated for um, December the 7th. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I mentioned this before, but this is an update. This is for Will Scotus East Church State Line and School Choice Case. Um, and it says the U.S. Supreme Court justices on Wednesday heard arguments in a case that could have paved the way to direct public funding to religious schools. The court's conservative, conservative justices appear in favor of reversing a policy in Maine that prevents public tuition funding from going to schools to provide religious education. You can read the full update at the Education League. And the New York Times also published it on 12.8 and Reader on 12.8 as well. Okay. 
takes me a moment to share. All right, so the next one is from Middle Web Smart Brief, and it was sent to our email on December 8th. Okay, teaching in the middle. This is on the last section. It says, Reading challenge offers sweet rewards. A sweet treat to wait middle school students participating in a winter reading challenge in Walla Walla, Washington. Participants will be entered into drawings for ice cream from Pinecone Creamery, and the grand prize winner will decide the name of a new flavor of ice cream. Staff are also getting involved in the challenge, and their efforts will be will also be rewarded with ice cream. The full story can be found at the Walla Walla Union Dash Bulletin in Washington, dated 12-8. Under classroom innovation from this briefing, um, it has the program of six students with disabilities in PE and art. Care Buddies in Norris Middle School adaptive physical education program helps classmates with disabilities participate in activities such as table tennis, bowling, and jumping rope, which teacher Savannah Harmon says has boosted inclusion in and out of the gym. The Peer Buddy program is also offered in art and other classes that are common. The full story was picked up by WAPE-TV in Knoxville, Tennessee. Dated December 7th, if you're interested in this one. Okay, uh, also in Tennessee, a tutoring program aimed at boosting achievement. A new program funded by the state of Tennessee will use small group tutoring to battle pandemic related learning loss. The Tennessee Accelerated Literacy and Learning Courts will involve small frequent tutoring sessions for students grades one through eight. And you can see the full story of that in the journal updated 12-7. I will say, you know, we offer a tutoring program as well as filling the gap type tutoring. And I really believe in our tutoring program. And I believe it's, it's far superior to what we're reading about here. So if you're interested in that, we only charge 45 a month right now because of COVID. We lowered it uh, from weekly costs, and it's been like that through the entire pandemic. So if you really want high-quality tutoring, check us out and um, you know enroll. It's free to enroll in New Heights, and you can be enrolled in, in any school and receive all kinds of opportunities. Um, this is under Middle Web Records recommends in the same smart brief says actions educators can take to reduce student trauma. It says trauma is widespread among students in our schools today. Wonder why. School psychologist Caitlin Ulrich explores several actions educators can take to help alleviate its ill effects. From deliberate steps to strengthen adult student relationships to system-wide planning to improve trauma support. You can read more about this um, at middleweb.com and there's search, uh, you know, a little eyeglass or a little magnifying glass and it says actions can take, actions can take to reduce student trauma by Middleweb published December 8th. A free resource for flashcards and more. Kathy Paul Mary likes the free teacher owned Flippity site offering engaging teaching tools in all subjects. She shows how to easily create multimedia flashcards, involve classes, and randomly choose a partner in making interactive spelling lists tailored to students. You can look that one up 
address. That's also on the middle web. And you'll you'll be able to type that into it as well. And let me see. There is a link to what she was talking about. So you can create your own if you want to use that resource. Take another quick commercial break and then we'll be right back. This podcast is brought to you by Silicon Valley Hosting, the world's fastest growing video based, self paced, teacher supported, fully accredited online school that's recommended by more than 96% of the students. Make it a few courses within $95 each or earn your high diploma. Welcome back to the New Heights Showing Education. I'm Liz Clark, and we're doing a youth and education show. And we're going to get right back into it where uh, the next, next one that I have for you is from Ohio Edit Bates. It said on December the 10th, it says state and local education news. Marion City Schools awarded $339,000 from Ohio Department of Education for career pathways. The Marion Star reports that Marion City Schools were awarded a $339,000 workforce incentive program grant on November 23rd from the Ohio Department of Education to add two, two new options to the district's career pathways programming an electrical pathway along with information technology networking. The Toledo Blade reports that the rule change allows for non-degree substitute teachers. If you heard about this, I recently heard about it. With too few college graduates applying for open substitute teaching positions, some school district leaders are turning to novices without degrees to fill in for absent educators. What do you think of that? What are your thoughts? I mean, they want to make such a big deal about having a degree and you can't teach without one and all this. What do you think of that? I can personally tell you that of all of our, our tutors, our certified teachers that we had, all of our tutors, when they're working with someone whether it's someone with special needs or so called regular child, there is no difference in the world. So, but it's interesting that they're being forced to join this. I think it's, it's really interesting because of, of how they've always been about it. So, um, John, this is another story from WOIO, I believe it is. And it's from says John Safe Place opens at Independence Middle School in honor of college grad who died from suicide in 2017. A special calming room that allows students to reset mentally if they are feeling overwhelmed throughout the day has opened at the Independence Middle School. I'm switching again. A lot of repeated articles. It just takes me so long to. I don't want to miss anything, and I have these lined up to cover. So, okay, so this is from Smart Brief on Special Education Day, dated December the 10th. Came into our email box, and it says, Independence to School Barkery through their work with Gahana Barkery, a micro business, a micro business created by the Special Education Department, Gahana Lincoln High School in Ohio. Students with disabilities learn how to budget and work and find motor and language skills. The business created when the pandemic prevented students from participating in community work programs has fostered a sense of independence in 
many students as intervention specialist Shane Natalie. If you would like to see the full story of the Columbus Dispatch in Ohio, share this on December the 9th. Also, a music program for students with disabilities open. A new center in Southern Florida will help students with disabilities make music while accommodating their education needs. The Southwest Florida Music Education Center offers two and four year certificates, says President Rob Moyer. You can see the full story at WSTX TV at Cape. Florida and it was published December 9th. Also in the same report, it says students' behavior issues on the rise. Schools nationwide are citing the transition from remote to in-person learning for an uptick in disciplinary issues and even violence on campus. The coronavirus pandemic has worsened student behavior more than other traumatic events, including the September 11th attack, says Frank Zanier, a school psychologist and crisis management specialist in Miami. You can see the full story on the Wall Street Journal dated December the 9th. Uh, students create digital portfolios for interviews. Students at a Kentucky high school are developing digital portfolios to present to school officials and local professionals in interviews. Students say the process helps them prepare for professional job interviews, where they present the portfolios that include details about school achievements and jobs. WNKY-TV in Bowling Green, Kentucky reported this on December the 8th. If you want to look it up. This is an interesting one. Um, it's titled Family Focused Nutrition Improves Diet and Kids with Autism. It says research published in the Journal of Nutrition Education and behavioral suggests that a family centered nutrition program can provide dietary benefits to children who have autism. The program includes nutrition and fitness activities and education over a period of six weeks with a high level of parent support and attention to barriers faced by families with children with autism. The complete story can be found at Helio. A-T-A-L-I-O, dated 12-8. Now, I will say that I don't know about their program, okay? I don't, I don't know if it's worth it or not. But I will tell you that uh, I follow Flav City, F-L-A-V-T-I-T-Y. And in my opinion, there's nobody better to get you on the right track whether you have health issues, disabilities, or or just you want to change your diet, you want to eat healthier. And I would just highly suggest that I get nothing. We have no type of partnership at all. It's just somebody I follow and really believe in, and I want to share it with you. So um, you may want to look into that. Okay, we only have time for a little bit more. Uh, stories. So, let's see here what I have. This one is from Fort Reef One at Tech as well, dated December 10th. And it says uh, ways that AI may help schools, students in 2022. Artificial intelligence assistants who can help manage classrooms, AI powered security solutions, and chatbots to aid and tutoring and family communication are among the educational technology trends expected in 2022. The full story can be seen at this EdTech um, dated December the 8th. I'm really suspicious of that stuff. I, I really, um, as of right now, I, I, I can't support it. I think it's just a little over the top. If there
already having trouble, you know, reaching students. I just, I just don't think I agree with that. I don't know what you think. You can share comments. I'd love to hear. And uh, yeah, love to hear what you think. Tell, tell help offered to California Community College students. About 20 California community colleges have partnered with Timely MD to provide around the clock virtual health and wellness services. The program is set up through the Foundation of California Community Colleges with state funding. You can see the full story of campus technology defeated December the 7th. Um, repeat. All right, let's see. This is from AFCD Smart Brief. This is titled Schools Add More Half Days to Tackle Teacher Burden. Some school districts in Virginia and Maryland are scheduling more half days to help curb teacher burden. School leaders say the move will help support teachers. Some parents are concerned about the loss of instructional time. The whole story can be found at the Washington Post and dated December 12th. Also in, in Washington, D.C., schools adopt food education programs. I think I had mentioned this before to you. Um, it says students at 19 schools in Washington, D.C. are learning how to grow, harvest, and cook vegetables through a curriculum from Fresh Farm and Cook Food Print. The program was created by two educators to integrate garden-based science lessons for food education. The full story is picked up by the Washington Post and dated December 12th. Um, in Los Angeles, um, they're expecting to get a new superintendent, superintendent uh, Carvalho, Alberto Carvalho, superintendent of Miami-Dade County Public Schools, will be leaving Florida after being named superintendent of the Los Angeles Unified School District. A former high school science teacher, Carvalho, or Carvalho, excuse me, will depart to the Florida district, fourth largest in the U.S., that has been leading since 2008 to take the helm of the California district, the country's second largest. The full story was picked up by the Associated Press on 12-9 and WFOR-TV in Miami, Fort Lauderdale on 12-10, and the Miami Hero on 12-10. Um, also in Los Angeles, the uh, Unified School District is considering a plan to delay a requirement for eligible, eligible students to be vaccinated against the coronavirus. Officials say the plan to extend the deadline from January 10th to next fall will allow time for the 34,000 students who are not in compliance to be vaccinated. The story was covered by Reuters on 12:10, the 74 on 12:10, and the Los Angeles Times on 12:10. It was titled "LA Considers Delay for Students at Sea Main Base." Have another report from Ohio at updates from December 13th. 
Yeah. What did you hear? Does Enon Teen win one of 30 back to school scholarships? Springfield News uh, Gas Sun reports the Enon Teen is one of, one of 30 statewide winners in the first round of Ohio Department of Health back to school scholarships, which encourages young people to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Ozea Lamaster, who will be a freshman in Renan High School in the fall, will receive a $100,000 scholarship from the state. She plans to use the money for culinary school. Her mother, Mandy Lamaster, said five other Miami Valley teams were also selected for the scholarship. Uh, East Liverpool Times Review reports that Southern local teachers received JCE SC mini grants. Teachers in the Southern local school district are enriching learning opportunities for students after receiving allocations to the Jefferson County Educational Service Center. The JCE SC Director of Curriculum and Professional Development and Ron Simondo presented three $600 best practice grants during the November 15th school board session for Karen Marquis, Janice Pierce, and Eric Sampson to enhance education in their respective classes. And will the new parents, Gainesville School, foresee return of book box trucks? Gainesville City School officials have begun planning to prevent it back to bring back a popular summer program they said benefited kids and the pandemic. Heading into the summer of 2021, officials in the district were especially concerned for the learning loss caused by student missing class time amid coronavirus shutdowns and quarantine. In the Dina, in the Dina Gazette, they reported that students' writers converged on Cloverleaf High School for writing tournaments. More than 160 pupils from 50, 15 excuse me, Ohio high schools competed Saturday in the third annual Just Write Writing Contest at Cloverleaf High School. Pupils were assigned various genres of fiction, including mystery, historical, science fiction, realistic fiction, and classical horror, or narrative nonfiction, and given 45 minutes to write a three-page story. Teacher coaches judged the work. The tournament was organized by Just Right Ohio, a Toledo-based nonprofit interscholastic writing competition organization. The Medina County Arts Council provided the funding. And our last report of today is from the Rooster Daily Record. Uh, it's titled Ohio Model of United Nations Teams from West Holmes Represents Australia and Germany. 14 West Holmes High School students attended the largest global education program in the nation, December 5th through the 7th, according to a news release from West Holmes, Ohio, model of United Nations Teams represented the nation. Australia with Wyatt Carter, Carter, Zach Kraft, Sammy Latoff, Kylie Tro Troyer, Hayden Barnes created a resolution on both a shocking solution to a hot topic and performed a native story using did Jerry do and collapsed it. Well, thank you for joining me for another news and education. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was informative. And I wish everyone happy, safe holidays, and Merry Christmas. Have a good one, everyone. See you at the next show. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Don't forget to rate us and follow us on your podcast player. Check out our show page, radio.newheightseducation.org for monthly announcements and other happenings.